There's my smiling co-host. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Two Legs. This is episode number 183. And everybody, my name is Andy Nichols, and I am joined by my partner in crime, my co-host. Uh, you might recognize him from the other uh, Beatles-related solo podcast that he does called Talk More Talk, a show that he does with his co-host, um, Kid O'Toole, Joel Mayo, and Ken Michaels, and that is Tom Hunyadi from Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Thomas. Hello, Andy. Good to see you, my friend. And uh, you may know Andy from his other show. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the Other Leg. The uh, other. Andy's Music Vaults. Yeah, The Other. <laughs> yeah, the, the Other. The Other Leg, yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for the plug, partner. Um, yeah, yeah th- you know, things are good. So we're back again for another fresh installment here for this week we are going to tackle um a second kind of new kind of a show that uh, we're doing there's tom holding it up right there yeah. um we're actually so last month uh, i think it was yeah. last month we did an in-depth episode kind of like where we kind of just structurally looked at one of paul's interviews from over the years and kind of and last and we, the one we did uh, last month was the 84 playboy interview and this month we we got a lot of good feedback to that episode So this month we decided to do another one again. And the one that we chose was the one that Tom was holding up right there, which really holds a lot of significant um, historical value because it was Paul's first ever in-depth interview with Rolling Stone. And we know that Rolling Stone was a very pro John publication. Yes. Okay. With Jan Wenner. And here's Paul sitting down for his first interview. So we'll get to all that as we go through the interview, but, uh, it's our second one of this series, and we're going to pick a few others as we do this, uh, you know, the kind of where we pick an interview that Paul's done, not not necessarily with Rolling Stone, with wherever we might find one. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, if, and if you out there know of one or want to see us kind of tackle one, and we've kind of just selectively, we're not going to go through the whole interview, but we're going to pick out the best bits that Tom and I both agree upon and kind of just chew the fat on those answers and how he answered them as he was feeling at the time. But yeah. let me just say, as a, as a PSA to everybody watching this show, okay, uh, if you'd like to follow along with this interview, okay, the link to the interview is in the description box below. So if you're watching this uh, live as we drop the episodes as we normally do, and today we're dropping this episode on the 15th of October, please click the link and open it up in another browser, and you can follow along this interview uh, and see where we're going with it when uh, Tom and I decide to look at some of the questions and the answers that Paul uh, gave in right. this interview. Um, it was first full scale interview. So take it away, partner. Yeah. Well, you know, this is uh, again, another kind of, you know, pretty good interview. I mean, there's some, some good sound bites uh, in this one, you know, Paul, uh, you know, not the best haircut. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, I think, well, didn't Linda, wasn't Linda doing, uh, his, 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 his hair, uh, back then, but, uh, you're down, the, uh, you're down. You're not down with the McCartney 73 mullet, <laughs> <You're not. laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah. So this was, uh, by what Paul, uh, Gambaccini, uh, Paul Gambaccini, who's interviewed Paul yeah. on numerous occasions. Right. And this is, uh, I mean, this came out episode or this issue came out in January of 74. Uh, it was conducted in the second half of, of 73. I mean, as we know, I mean, Paul was a very busy uh, in 73 with, with, with tours and, and recording Red Rose Speedway, Live and Let Die. Singles. And then, you know, singles, yeah, later in the year, then with Band on the Run. You know, so not, very not, not to mention James Paul McCartney TV special. There you Bruce, go. Yeah. Bruce, Bruce McMouse, which got shelved. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So and, and these little snippets are, are in this interview. I mean, we talked about before with other guests that were a little older than us and, you know, not having the Internet back then. You know, how did you get your information? How did you, you know, would you have heard about Bruce McMouse back then? And. You know, if you read this interview, you this might have been the first time you heard about Bruce McMouse. Right. What's you Bruce know? McMouse? Oh, it's a film that he yeah. talked about in Rolling Stone in, right. in January right. of 74. But that's it. That is it. That is it. So, um, yeah. So, again, interesting stuff. I mean, this the again, a few of these comments from Paul, we've heard a dozen times, dozen, dozens of times. You even, make a very good you know, point here with this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because it starts off with him telling the story of 
of you know meeting Dustin Hoffman and and re and um you know reading the uh, what was it the Time magazine or something like that regarding the the death of Picasso and his you know last words you know drink to me and then you know how he put that 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 whole song together and, and right. it was amazing you know you know dustin hoffman couldn't believe it <laughs> but that was the first time that it was told we know it right for, nearly right. 40 almost 40 years on we know that that but that was probably right. the first time he said that so it's fresh this is fresh this is late 73 when he's telling the story and as we know i mean you know with the band on the run was recorded you know late 73 so oh, yeah well, released released in released. December. yeah right um you know, it comes out in December of 73. So, you know, McCartney spends, you know, a bulk of 74 really on the PR campaign of what and the success of Band on the Run charting the top, you know, the, you know, the top of the charts in 74. And then right. before, you know, he goes to Nashville in June of 74, but yeah. and he does McGear and loads of other stuff in 74. Right. But it was really the year where he kind of just sat back and um, took in a lot of the commercial success that, you know, was long overdue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is the first critical, time critical yeah. success. Let me refer you. Right. He's had the commercials, the critical success, because we all know critical nobody liked success. Nobody liked anything right. before that. So right, because it it is. It's, we should also note that the ban on the run review is also in this in this issue as well. You know, so uh, it is. A, should you know, as a side note, I do believe this is with this cover. Linda on the cover is the first time that a person who took a picture um, uh, that ended up a, a, on the cover of Rolling Stone with, I think, her picture of uh, Evira Clapton, and then also, uh, you know, Ending up is on the, on cover, the cover, on on cover, cover as herself. well. Yes, exactly. So I think that's the first time that has ever happened. Yeah, um, probably, I don't didn't know happen. probably didn't happen too much if it had at right. all ever since. Yeah, yeah. So uh, getting into the interview. So after he tells the story, um, then, you know, Paul gets into the questions. And first up is um, he's well, continuing to come. Well, go ahead. I was just going to say, just to give some people some context, you know, following yeah, along, I want to just kind of read what Paul says here, just about the, the restructure of the interviews, how they were done at the end of the introduction. Yes, yeah. He says, our interviews were delayed by some months, first by a Wings tour, later by a series of recording sessions in Nigeria. Even after all that wait, the McCartneys seemed surprised at how much we wanted to know. In the end, they were interviewed in a London recording studio, Paul's Soho office, Lee Eastman, Paul's father-in-law's offices and apartment in New York, uh, and the studio of uh, the cover photographer who took the photo uh, as the interview begins. So, you know, it was not, it was conducted, you know, over, the long, over a long period of time. And mm -hmm. it's just very interesting that Gambaccini says here that the McCartneys seemed surprised at how much we wanted to know. i got to remember here context here you know their yeah. their their guard had to be up you know this is the big yes. mighty rolling stone here sitting down for an interview with the with the you know pizza and fairy tales mccartney's here you know <laughs> not my it's not how i feel but that's how what's right. how rolling stone felt so i could understand if paul and linda were a little bit oh uh -huh, we got these yeah. we got the heavyweights coming in this isn't crawdaddy or crane coming in here this, these are the big mm -hmm. dogs right Right. And I wonder what if there was, you know, Paul gave them any stipulations, you know, regarding the interview. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll talk about this. I won't talk about that. Uh, obviously, you know, there's lawsuits going around at this point in time. Sure. You know, we know he that, that's, that doesn't really want to talk about the Beatles, but I mean, he still does from time to time. And, uh, you know, he does here a little bit as well. But, um, yeah. you know, it's still a very telling, telling interview. And uh, yeah, I mean, he seems like, you know, his guards up a little bit, but it starts to, you know, as the interview comes gradually continues it seems like his guards coming down a little bit he's seems like he's open to talk about things um there's one thing where he, he you know they're talking about the james paul mccartney special but he's yeah. not saying why you know what i mean we'll, we'll get to that as you right. know as, so as yeah so, what, you know. so again we're not going to go through the whole interview tom and i because I mean, there's yeah. some old there's some well-told Beatles stories in this thing so tom and i basically scanned the interview and read it and, and basically agreed upon that you know here are the, the parts that we're going to kind of just kind of highlight and go through so if you're following along the interview in the link you know you're going to see us jump ahead to some questions that we're going to skip over yeah if you need to pause the interview pause the interview and then and, and, you know find the question but um you know excuse me hold on excuse me um excuse you 
Yeah, excuse me. This twice yeah, Coke. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta quit the soda thing again. At least you, uh, at least you call it soda out by you and not pop like some places <laughs> in the rest of the country. I, I can go. I, yeah, I call it pop. I call it soda. You know, I thought you just, were a pop guy. You know, you Midwestern yeah. people. You say pop. Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. What do you guys call it out there? What, what do you call it? Put it in the comments section. Pop or soda? What is it to you? What do you or call Coke. it? You know, some people, you know, there's there's some places that just call everything a Coke. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, Texas. Um, okay, so. So kick it off. What, 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 what first grabbed your attention here with the question? I, you know, I, I like the, yeah, you know, regarding the, you know, the first question right off the bat, you know, first couple questions, you know, the making a band on the run, an album that was just released, you know, you know, a few weeks prior. And, uh, you know, this is the first time we're actually hearing any kind of stories about it. So it was the, then there was the trouble in Nigeria with uh, fellow Ransom uh, Cootie, um, you know, and Paul's, yeah, he goes, yeah, I heard about that. All, all it was is we were recording in Lagos. Lately, we've gone to two different places to record just for the fun of it. We've been to Lagos and to Paris and both places. They say, why did you come here? <laughs> we've got much better studios in England or America. Uh, you must be deaf. And we say, well, it's just for the fun of it. And, he, and you know, he, he does this throughout his career. He'll just go to different locations, right, to to make an album just to get away or whatever. Just to, just to change try it up. Something new. Yeah, to change and it up. And also maybe here. for tax reasons, too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Uh, well, it's 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 just uh, for the fun, uh, just to come somewhere different for a different type of turn on. That's all. Uh, they never really seem to be able to understand it. Uh, I think old fella, uh, when we found us in Lagos, thought, "Hello, why have they come to Lagos?" And uh, and the only reason he could think of is that we must be stealing black music, uh, black African music, uh, the Lagos sound. We come down there to pick it up. So I said, do us a favor. We do okay as it is. <laughs> We're not pinching your music, which, you know, in, you know, musicians in general, they, they, you know, everybody pinches everybody. And, and McCartney has said that, you know, that we pinch, you know. He does, but I remember he, and he tells yeah. in the Wingspan documentary when he says he plays, right. he plays fellow Ransom Cootie, you know, a little bit of right. the band on the run tapes. And he's like, and he hears stuff like, you know, Jet and stuff. And he's like, Are you, is this right. stealing your music? Not really, you know? Exactly, exactly. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, he goes, you've just had some musicians uh, leave, haven't you? Huh. Um, you know, and then here we go. I mean, here's, uh, you know, the, the, the thing is, he, you know, Paul likes to say that, you know, both musicians left, you know, the night before um, they went to Lagos to record Band on the Room. But only um, one, only, that's only true out of one member, really. Right, right, yeah. Uh, had, Henry had already uh, left Henry some was gone. time prior. Yeah. Uh, our drummer, Denny, didn't want to come to Africa. I don't quite, I don't uh, know quite why. Uh, he was a bit nervous about coming to Africa. We're all going to Africa to record, and if the drummer won't come, what do you do? You you don't say, well, uh, we'll see you when, when we get back. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. You understand, uh, and then uh, and then you he just, leaves. You just uh, say goodbye. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think uh, Henry came to head one day uh, when you asked him to play something. He didn't really fancy playing. So, you know, we've heard the story of, you know, about Paul, you know, pretty much demanding, you know, Henry to play the same thing, you know, every night for the most part. And uh, I think we know good, by good now. Telling, good telling end of the sentence here with the quote, though. I don't think there was anything wrong with them as musicians. They were both good right. musicians. They just didn't fit in. Okay, so here we go. Good musicians, and we remember what Linda said, you know, back in the '84. You know, the one we talked interview. about last month. Right. So exactly, really slogging off the wings, musicians. Which, you know, if he, if he was going to slog them off, he would have done it in this interview because right. know, the, he was still right. scorned from them leaving. And obviously, with hindsight and the forty years plus, Paul and Denny Sywell obviously have right. patched things up and have a great relationship. And Denny Sywell is a very, very accomplished musician. And, you know, it, it just, right. at the time, Denny, Denny was a, a very, very well uh, sought after session drummer and mm -hmm. wanted to make a little bit of a better living. And, he, you know, so don't be, it was going to Africa after playing with Wings for two and a half years. He was like, I don't know if he'll want to do this. So listen, it's decades old at this point, but it's, it's you know, he just says right. I didn't fit in. And, that's a nice way right. of something, you know, just kind of just dismissing it and moving on. 
Right. So uh, next question is, what was your reaction uh, when you read the stuff at the time? Now, he's referring oh, to yeah. Yeah, uh, this John, is about you know, John's. yeah, he's talking about John now. And he's referring to when John, uh, you know, called him like, you know, people like Engelbert Humperdinck. Uh, you know, Paul says, oh, I hated it. You can imagine this. I sat down, poured over every little paragraph, every little sentence. Does he really think that of me? I thought and uh, at the time I thought it's me. I am. Um and uh, that's uh, that's just what I, I'm like. Uh, he's catching me so well. I'm a turd. You know? <laughs> I sat down and really thought I'm just nothing. But then, we, well, kind of uh, people who dug me like Linda, you know, that's not true. You're you're joking. He's got he's he's got a grudge. Um, and the guy's trying to polish you off. Gradually, I started to think, great, uh, that's not true. It's not really uh, I'm not really like uh, Engelberg. I don't really write ballads. Uh, I don't just write ballads. Right, sorry. I don't just write just ballads. That kept me right. hanging on, but all the time, I'll tell right. you, it hurt me. Phew, deep. Yeah. Of course it did. Of course yeah. it did. Yeah, right. Um, and then he goes on saying, uh, asking, uh, could you uh, write a song like or songs this. with John again? I like yeah. this answer. For, for, yeah. for 1974, 73, he's saying, I could. It's totally yeah. fresh ground right now because I just got my visa, too. About right. two or three days ago, until then, I couldn't physically write a song with John. He was in America. He couldn't get out. I couldn't get in. But now that's changed. So whole new possibilities are opening up. Anything could happen. I'd like to write with John. I'd like to write with anyone who's good. That's that's 73. Right. Yeah, that's 73. So, you know, obviously, you know, the as as we've discussed with our with our buddy Atney, you know, in the Lennon McCartney shows sure. that we, we series we did, you know, the smoke is clear, the slogging has pretty much, you know, cooled off in the press. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there was lots of possibilities for them to get back together again and write. It just, you know, again, it never happened. Um, so now this here is, we get to the next this is question. This is, yeah, this is where, you know, you, you, you know, if you never knew, you know, about Bruce McMouse, this is how you were going to hear about it. You know, um, uh, right now you're, you're right now, you yourself are working on the mouse gang, Quote the mouse gang. <laughs> Which right. is interesting. Of Gambaccini, Gambaccini <laughs> called it the Mouse Gang. Mouse Gang. Uh, Paul goes, no, it's not the Mouse Gang. It's a show that will be called uh, the Bruce McMouse Show. So obviously that was still in the works as of uh, late '73. Yeah. You know, and, and, then, uh, Gambaccini, and those were... Gambaccini says I was thinking of Zoo Gang, which ended up being right. the B side to Band on the Run. Band on the Run. Right. Um, Paul goes, uh, the zoo game, that's right. That, that was just a, a, a theme tune for a television show I was asked to do. Bruce Mouse is another thing. We filmed the last couple of dates at the end of the Wings' first European tour. Bruce lives under the stage. You see Bruce and his family are animated, and their exports are spliced in uh, between Wings footage for a television film. And we so, did review the Bruce McMouse film on a previous right. episode of Two Legs oh, about two years ago now. So check that one out. And we actually did commentary yeah. along with it, I think. Right. So if you're reading this, you know, if you're a Paul fan and you're reading this and, you know, and you're, you're hearing this about a, a upcoming Bruce McMouse TV show, you know, and you're in class, you know, you talk to your friends about this and you're looking like they're looking at you like, well, what the hell are you talking about? This, what's, what's this mouse animated what's this, show? What's this mouse? That, well, you said Paul's. Doesn't, Right. right. Yeah. And it never shows up, you know. Not until 2018. Right. <laughs> not until 2018. 35, yeah, 35 years later, 40, you know, whatever, 45 years I later. I mean, not a, not a one, not a boot. I mean, not for the masses. Right. I don't think a bootleg and all, and I, I know you're not a bootleg guy and all my collecting fests, I never saw an opportunity to even buy a bootleg copy of Bruce McMouse anywhere. Read a lot well, about not, it. Not but, not only that, I mean, no no pictures of stills, of what, stills, yeah, exactly. Anything, not 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 a thing from that. Just about this film, and uh, you know, that's interesting. It was shelved, and we finally got it. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Um, Give Ireland back to the Irish ah. was the first of your singles in eight years that didn't sell in America and Britain. Interesting um, that he says eight years because he's including the Beatles period. In Beatles, there. right? Exactly. Your uh, first Paul single in eight years. I just thought that yeah. the question was interesting to to lump yeah. in the Beatles with his his own stuff. 
yeah, you would you would think that he wouldn't have done it that way, but uh, it is interesting that he lumps in the Beatles. Uh, Paul goes, before I did that, I always used to think, God, John's Crackers doing all these political songs. Uh, yeah. I understand he feels really deeply, you know, so do I hate all that. I So, 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 so do, do I. I. Yeah. yeah, I hate all that Nixon bit, all that Ireland bit, all the oppression anywhere. Um, I think uh, our mob do, our generation do hate uh, that and wish it could be changed. But up until the actual time, um, uh, when a few people, a bit like Kent, state the, the moment uh, when it's actually there at our doorstep, I, I always used to think uh, it's still cool uh, to not say anything, but because it's not going to sell anyway. And no one's going to be interested. So I tried. It was a number one in Ireland. And, and funnily enough, uh, it was number one in, in, in Spain of all places. In so, Spain. So, yeah. And again, yeah. there's some great. We've included that clip in our in a previous episode that we talked about. I give my own back to the Irish. I think the anniversary right. of the uh, the singles and stuff. And he's very, at the time, <clears throat> he was very, very, uh, you know, spoke out well spoken about it. Just on that one time, mm -hmm. you know. And you can see Just that the one there. time. Right. Just the one time. And you see, he goes on this one time. I felt that we just go overstepped, you know, what we could be, you know. Right. So um, there he is, you know, Gambaccini asking about, which again, I know it all is it fades into memory, but by yeah. the end of '73, Paul is long past "Give Ireland Back to the Irish." You know, that's yeah. that's the winter exactly. of '70. That's early '72. When '72, that yeah. So this exactly. is all almost two years later. Almost. Almost, yeah. Um, you know, I, funnily enough. Um, at the end of that question, he, he writes, at this point, Paul receives word uh, that a playback for Bruce McMouse is beginning the control room, so he excuses himself, uh, so uh, Linda stays behind. So I'm, I'm hoping, when I'm reading this, I'm hoping, oh, we're going to get some fun tidbits juice. from Linda. <laughs> juice. Juice. Some, yeah, some juice. But, you know, it, that, not unfortunately, that, not nothing, but uh, he does ask Linda about, um, uh, you do have a novelty single coming up. Uh, and Linda says, yes, I did a song, Seaside Woman, uh, right after we'd been to Jamaica about three or four uh, years ago, I guess, uh, very reggae-inspired. Sure. That's when ATV was uh, suing us, saying I was incapable of writing. So Paul said, get out and write a song. And then a, a few weeks ago, went in uh, to do a B-side. Well, we'll um, get to that later in the interview. The, the, yeah, this, this yeah. ties into the show, but yeah. Exactly. So uh, we're going to put out the single under the name Susie and the Red Stripes. So when we were in Jamaica, uh, there had been a fantastic reggae version of Susie Q. So uh, so they used uh, to call me Susie. And in the beer, the Jamaica is or the Red beer in Jamaica is called Red Stripe. Red yeah. Stripe. So that's where she's pretty much, you know, saying, talking about Seaside Woman, uh, a song they had been playing during the pre, you know, the previous tour. And again, if you weren't in if you weren't in the UK to see the, or in Europe to, uh, to see them play, you didn't know anything about seaside woman. No. Right. I mean, long, you didn't know long, anything long gone right. by the time wings right. it's, it's America. So now you're thinking, okay, we're going to get this, uh, the single from, from Susie and the red stripes called seaside woman. And again, you don't get this into this put on hold then until what was the thing of 78, 77, 78. 77. Um, yeah. Yeah. 77. So, you know, again, you know, you're you're getting these good little tidbits of news or upcoming releases, but you know, you don't know when they're going to come out. So no, so interesting stuff there. I love um, this next moving. question that we highlighted here. Um, do you often go back to Liverpool? And yes, he says we visit to keep touch with the Liverpool scene. My family roots are up there. Our kids love it. My brother still lives there. In fact, we're going to make an album with him in January. And exactly. So G Gambaccini right. asks him, will it come out as a Mike McGear album? And he says, that's right. It's a singing thing. He's quit comedy for the moment. We're going to do it at the Strawberry Studios in Stockport. We'll play it by ear. It's Mike's album. Right. Yeah. So again, you know, you're getting a bunch of news about upcoming projects that he's working on. Again, you just don't know. The um, Lost Wings album. Out. The Lost Wings yeah, album. Of the 74. Lost Wings album. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, something, you know, to look, you know, to look forward to uh, in the following year, which, you know, that did come out sooner rather than later, like the other two projects that uh, they were talking about. Um, let's see here. Uh, Paul goes, were you frightened of, of a possible negative reaction when you released your solo album, McCartney? It was your first break from the Beatles. Uh, he goes, I was I was as confident as I ever am about any LP. 
I realized it was more kind of a throwaway and done at home than any of our previous ones, but that wasn't a reason to worry about it. You never know what people are going to think about a record anyways. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I guess, you know, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, he then goes on to ask, the handout on the British edition of McCartney didn't appear in the America. Why was that? Now he's talking about now, the questionnaire. The Q&A. The Q&A. Yes. Right? That was the self yeah. The self-produced, you know, Q&A that Peter Brown helped him with. And he goes on to explain it here. Yeah, so Linda and I did a mail out from our house. We had made up uh, this little interview for friends and the press and sent uh, sent them out with about the first hundred albums. Okay, so there you go. Somebody uh, thought it was supposed to be a thing that came with the album, probably because we didn't explain it in the mail. <laughs> Right. Uh, we should have it said enclosed for uh, enclosed fine press kit. Yeah, there you go. People got the idea. It came with the album, but it didn't come out. What's it? But it didn't come out in Britain in the copies in the stores. Okay. Right. It was more of a just, to... right. A hundred yeah. probably a hundred copies included that, which went out to radio right. and promotional people. You couldn't buy a copy of the album with that in it. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. He goes. I had asked Peter Brown of Apple for a list of questions he thought might uh, have inter interesting answers. Looking back, it seems a bit blunt and weird, but at the time, it wasn't uh, meant to be. Things like, are you going? Are you going to be another John and Yoko? <laughs> No, we're going uh, no, to be a Paul and Linda. Yeah. So, uh, again, I mean, these are the first time you're hearing, you know, of these things, yeah. you know, unless you're in the UK. I mean, if you're in America and you're reading this, I mean, these a lot of this is the first time you're hearing this stuff. Yep. Right. Jumping ahead a All little right. bit. We jump, Jumping ahead a little to bit. The, pull ahead of the, about the Beatles stuff and we go. Uh, Gambaccini now asks him about the films yeah. and the TV shows. Yeah. Your two yeah. big television shows were the James Paul McCartney and Magic. Again, he's lumping the Beatles in here. Your two big television right. shows were James Paul McCartney and Mystery Tour. How are these conceived? I'm, I'm fascinated that he's lumping the Beatles projects in with his solo stuff. I really right. am, I, I am with that, but you know, he, he, that's what he's doing. Yeah, I would love to ask him what his you know thought process on that was. I mean, why is he why is he doing that? We Does know, he consider we, we, we know that Mystery Tour was largely a Paul project. Paul we know project, that. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, we know that now. I mean, back in '73, no. I, I mean, I don't know if he if he knows that or if anybody knows that or not. You know, no. Um, yeah, the mystery show was conceived way back in Los Angeles on a plane. Um, but I want to get to. I mean, we know that, but I do want to get to the James Paul McCartney stuff. Oh, this, uh, the this James goes Paul... into the ATV stuff. Right, right, and which is more interesting. <laughs> Yes, it is. But the uh, the James Paul McCartney show, uh, where these people who wanted us to do a TV show, and they said they wanted a nice show, and said you can do it uh, any way you want. It seemed like a good opportunity, you know, kind of get on the telly. So that uh, that one was just worked up that way. We met a guy when uh, we went to Morocco. Uh, we were on holiday then, and then they came out, and we sat around on the pool, talked about various ideas, and came back in, in, to England and did it. I, so I'd he's obviously. To, I'd, I'd, I'd love to know whose idea it was to get 30 people singing Beatles songs on the street. <laughs> but then again, you know, um, he's not answering why it came. No, to he's not going into why this was done. As we now know, right. it was part right. of the deal, which Linda referenced earlier about the, you know, the, right. the, the, the writing, the writing, the uh, writing claim that she didn't write the songs. So they, he, he said, okay, I'll do a special for you for ATV. Mm -hmm. Right. And ended up doing James Paul McCartney, which was aired in America in April of 73 and in the UK in early May of 73. It was a few a few weeks apart when those were broadcast. Yeah. So um, um, it, it wasn't they just decided to do it. It was an agreement with right. Lou, Lou Grade is what it was. Lou Grade, yeah. But the point is, is that he's not really getting the specifics. You know, he's not yeah, getting Linda, into the lawsuit like Linda, Linda did. did. So right. Linda was being more vocal about it than, than Paul was. Right. Um, and then he goes back into Magical Mystery Tour. Uh, were you sorry that it didn't uh, was was not shown in America uh, at the time? Uh, hey, I thought, oh, blimey, but uh, it started out to be one of those kinds of things, like the wild one. Really. <laughs> You're going to lump in a Marlon Brando film uh, right. to the Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, that's a bit magical itself, like the Rolling Stones' Rock and Roll Circus. You know what happened to that? Um, again, you know, oh, it didn't it didn't come out until 1998. 
Right. And again, was. here's something that if you didn't hear about this, you're going, you're, your mind's blown. Like, well, what, what do you mean the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus? What is this? <laughs> that was a pretty well-known yeah. concert, though, that was filmed. I mean, every because everybody was involved with that, you know? Well, the, yeah, but that didn't mean necessarily mean everybody was talking about it. I mean, when did that um, that the Who, um, the Kids Are All Right um, uh, film come out? 1979. Uh, Okay, because that's when probably anybody saw anything from that for the first time, because their, their performance, their performance of, of, a, a of a quick one, one yeah, is is in that uh, with with different camera angles, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, again, it's it's just it's just you know, for me reading this, I mean, I wish I was like a thirteen year old back in you know seventy three or seventy four reading this, and I'm going, oh man, yeah, <laughs> you know, and then you ha had to wait, you know, another thirty years to get. To see you know, any 25 of, to years. See, to see yeah, it. 25 yeah. years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, interesting stuff. Moving forward. Um, okay, so uh, does that mean that you didn't uh, hold think on, too hold much? On. Before, before you jump oh, go ahead. ahead there. That's, yeah. Before that, he, so there's a question that uh, basically uh, he's asked, do you miss not having more people? Is there anyone that you ask oh. outside of people in the band? And it doesn't really go anywhere. But then he goes into reading about notices. This is where he talks about Ram. He goes, I still right. read the notices and stuff, and they're usually bum ones when you're expecting them to be great. Like after Ram, there are a lot of bum notices after Ram, but I keep meeting people wherever I go. Like I met mm -hmm. someone skiing, and as he skied past me, he said, quote, I loved Ram, Paul. So that's what I, that's really what I go by. Just the kind of people right. who flash by me in life. Just ordinary people, and they say they loved it. That's what I go by a lot. Sales, not just for the commercial thing. Like if a thing sells well. It means a lot of people bought it and liked it, like Red Rose Speedway and like Ram and like everything else. Wildlife, not so much, which kind of goes into the next question here. Right. Uh, does that mean then that uh, you didn't think too much uh, in retrospect of wildlife because uh, because of all your albums? Uh, no, I quite liked it. I must say you have to like me to like that record. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I mean, it's just taken cold. I think it wasn't that brilliant as a recording. Uh, we did it in about two weeks, the whole thing, and uh, had been done on that kind of buzz. We've been hearing about how Bob Dylan uh, had come in and done everything in one take. Again, not really Dylan, but uh, I, I understand. I, I think, in fact, often we never gave, gave the engineer a chance to even set up a balance. Uh, there's a couple of real big songs uh, on there uh, the, that only freaks our cons uh, connoisseurs know. Uh, I, I, I like tomorrow. that. I like yeah. that. That only freaks or connoisseurs, connoisseurs know, which would be know. us. And then he said, <laughs> yeah. and Bacini says, well, tomorrow. And Paul yeah, goes, tomorrow yeah, is one of them. Tomorrow, tomorrow is one of them. Yep. Yeah. So um, let's see here. Uh, you mentioned Dylan sort of being an inspiration for doing wildlife, uh, the way you did it. He's going on the road, of course, this month with the band, as in the band. Uh, right. Which well, that, that tour actually started in February of 74, the Dylan and the band tour, which was a great, okay. great short tour. That's what he that's the tour he's referencing, which later became out as the, before the flood which was the live album okay. that came out in 74 of the tour that Dan Bacini talking about right here. Okay. Which is a, which is a great good. live record. Yes. Right. Uh, going on. Uh, hi, hi, hi. Was uh, the one that brought you back to the top 10 <laughs> after give Ireland back to the Irish and Mary had a, Mary had a little lamb. Although in Britain, they played sea moon because hi, hi, hi was banned in the, the BBC. Um, you know, and again, and you're hearing about uh, stories probably for the first time here. Uh, I thought the high, high, high thing could easily be taken as a natural high. Okay, could be taken as, uh, as booze, high, and everything. It doesn't have to be drugs. Uh, you know, so I kind of get get away with it. Uh, well, the first thing they saw was drugs, so I didn't get away with that. <laughs> and then I just no. had some line uh, lie on the bed, uh, get you ready for uh, my polygon. But that thing about all that was our publishing company, Northern Songs, owned by Lou Grade. There uh, he is. The lyrics wrong and sent uh, them around a radio station, and it said, "Get uh, get you ready for my body gun." Uh, Again, so. I think. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. 
You should just fess up and say it's body gun because I just think the song works ten times better with the, the word body gun. Anyways, uh, which is far more suggestive than anything I put. Get ready for my polygon, which uh, watch out, baby. <laughs> I mean, it was suggestive, but abstract suggestive, which I thought I'd get away with. Uh, Bloody Company goes mm -hmm. around and makes it much more specific uh, by putting body gun, better words almost. So he's almost oh. admitting that um, – you know, maybe yeah. you should have done it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and they like the, about Helen Wheels but, here. Yeah. Uh, Helen Wheels has done better in America than England. This is something we've talked about in the past. You know, yep. singles doing better uh, here than in, in England. And uh, interesting. Um, uh, again, uh, Helen Wheels has done better in America than in England, uh, uh, as uh, have many of your records passed. Back in the old days, even, uh, have you ever thought of a reason why? Um, then he goes on. The only thing I can think of is the foreigner syndrome. We are, we're British, and that means something to an American. It's like some Americans who do better over here, like Cassidy and the Osmonds, even Elvis. So Right, but as we yeah. now know, that flipped in the 80s. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when, when he did very well with his own singles right. in the 80s in the UK, and he didn't do so hot here. I mean, as right. well. He did okay here, but not... The success that he did in his homeland, so it it flipped. It's just interesting. Oh, mm -hmm. that, that's always fascinating to look at that. And this is another fascinating one too, um, because you, I, I mean, over the last 20, 30 years, I've heard this brought up uh, from time to time. I agree uh, with it, but go ahead. Yeah. Um. Do you okay? It's been suggested that the Beatles provided something for Americans they had lost uh, with the with the death of Kennedy. Uh, youth, happiness, freedom from inhabitations. Inhabitations. Uh, does that make much sense to you? Inhibitions. Thank you. Uh, makes much sense to you. And he goes, No, none at all. Short <laughs> answer. None. Now, okay, yeah. we can give him credit. He is a foreigner. He's not American, so he right. probably doesn't understand what it felt like for the right. country to go through that. I, it doesn't make sense to him, which is fine, but I definitely know for a fact, and I'm sure people watching can attest to this, that right. you, know, the, you know, the arrival of the Beatles and the timing of that in the wake of Kennedy is one of the is one of the reasons why they they took off in this country. Other than they were great, would they have taken off anyway? Yeah, they would have. But right. the country <clears throat> needed something to jumpstart them after that assassination. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a very fair question and i think it, it, they represented all those things that campaigni campaigni talks about here youth happiness and freedom you know and mm -hmm. excitement something to look forward to you know the only other assassination up to that point was 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 lincoln in 1865 and nobody was really around still in, in 1963 to remember that so yeah. you know right. it was kennedy was the first you know irish catholic president and it was he was the, it was the tv age and he was everywhere and you know, it was every everything was much more Hollywoodified then. So, you know, that he oh was yeah, Oswald gets murdered on live TV. Uh, you know, so I it, mean, it was right. So, I, I don't expect Paul to understand all these American things, especially mm -hmm. especially back then in '63. But was the country ready for it? And did they did they need it? Absolutely, a thousand and ten percent. I I yeah, I agree with Campuccini there. Yeah, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two things that weren't really highlighted here. Um, uh, the Wings tour in 72, was that the oh, first yeah. time you had toured in six years, wasn't it? He goes, yes. He goes, had, your, had you attended to keep uh, it that long? He goes, oh, no, no, no. With the Beatles, we did a big American tour. And I think the feeling mainly from George and John was, oh, this is getting a little bit. Uh, uh, but I thought, no, you can't give up playing. Uh, we'd be crazy. But then we did a uh, concert tour I really hated, and I came off stormy and saying, bloody hell, I agree with you now. And I think that was the San Francisco show, the very yeah. the last last show yeah. of the tour anyways. <laughs> Candlestick, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, again, you know, we've we've heard all of these stories a million times now, but, I mean, this this is fresh. You got to look at it at, you know, I would love to hear from people who read this from the, for the first time. Uh, let us know in the comments, uh, you know, your thoughts as you're reading you know, these, uh, these comments or these answers from Paul, uh, moving ahead here. Let's me scroll down here. Yeah, he talks about, you know, when about the, the, the roots and, you know, play long, tall Sally yeah. and yeah. the fifties music and stuff like that. And basically, you know, come go with me and how John right. was singing it wrong. And he went to the Walton fate and all that stuff. So stuff that we, you know, um, 
you know, that we, that we know well told now, you know, and he talks about Stu mm-hmm. leaving, um, you know, and when, when he got his first guitar and stuff like that. So that's really how the right. interview really wraps up really. Right. And then uh, he goes here in America, the anthology album Beatles 67 to 70 and Red Rose Speedway were back to back number ones. You were replacing yourself. Uh, did that strike you as odd? Uh, I thought it was good rather than odd because obviously the bang hang up uh, after the Beatles broke up was uh, and really still is. Can any of them be as good as the unit? The answer in most people's mind, I think, is no, they can't because the unit was so good. I kind of agree. Oh, with that. right. I know. I missed that. I missed that. I would. I didn't keep yeah. scrolling down. I missed that. I didn't see. Yeah, that's all right. I didn't see the highlight. Um, huh. Yeah. Then there was the finally the the kind of oh, the lawsuit thing the lawsuit, here. Was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, I love uh, that. Um, uh, no, there was a lawsuit recently. The three the others other against three Klein. Others now yes. he's going. Oh, yes. I love that. I hope yeah. they win that one. See, but you can't tell me that he's sitting there right. with putting his feet up, going. He's gloating. Told you so. <laughs> I told you so. I told you three freaking people this guy was no right. good. And now right. I get to sit back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's great. He never he's... publicly would have admitted it, but you know privately he was just whistling oh. Dixie that he was right about that. You know it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, uh, that's great. You see, apart from everything that went down, all the little uh, personal conflicts, the reason why I felt I had to do what I what I had to do, which uh, ended up specifically as being I had to sue the other three. Uh, was that uh, there was no other way uh, I could sue Klein on his own, which is what I wanted to do. It took me months to get over the fact um, I kept saying said, I can't yeah. sue I can't sue the other three. I mean, yeah, just because it's very hard uh, news to go around suing someone you like. No matter what kind of personal things uh, we're going through down and John writing songs about me and all that stuff, I still didn't like, uh, I still didn't feel like the coolest thing in the world was to go and sue them. But I, but it actually turned out to be the only way to stop Klein. So I had to go out and do it. Then it all started to come out, you know, that Klein uh, had, per- had persuaded George. Um, I don't know how much of this is libelous. So now he's actually he's talking about you know probably not he shouldn't be talk, talking about this stuff. No. But then uh, Paul's uh, like uh, you know our lawyers uh, will take out what is li- libelous. Um, so. Um, then the yeah, I mean, this we go like, into the the Lou Grade claim. Right. Yeah. Let me get to that real quick here. Um, Nice Sorry, that he folks. mentions he mentions George's sue you move see sue you sue, sue me sue, sue you blues sue you blues right cool. <laughs> um but yeah getting back to to Paul you know you you know he uh you know a big relief had he you know probably it felt a big sigh of relief when they when the other three sued sued Klein uh, I mean that just pretty much you know right there and you, yeah and you know yeah. even john on public television even says that right. in a little interview right. bit you know let's just say paul was probably let right about <laughs> alan klein that right. probably took a lot of a lot of nerve for john to go on and swallow his pride and say right. that on tv right and i mean i mean i guess you can say that i mean if paul doesn't do that i mean by paul with paul doing that i mean he saves the beatles legacy doesn't saves he? it saves it yeah thousand percent saves the Beatles legacy because who knows, you know, right. would, would, would he, if he didn't, if he didn't sue them, what if he didn't sue them, you know, and all then, the Beatles what? are going to have an APCO logo on them. Yeah. You know, all the repressings after that would have a, uh, an APCO logo on them. I, ABCO. I, I would think yeah. Apple would be gone. All that would yep. be, it would all be, it would be all be APCO. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Linda mentioned Lou Grade's claim uh, that she couldn't write. And he goes, uh, that's an, that's an old one. Around the time we had millions of suits flying here, flying yeah. there, George wrote the "Sue Me, Sue You Blues" about it. Uh, I'd kicked it uh, all off originally, having sued uh, the other three Beatles in high court, and that opened Pandora's box. After that, everybody seemed to be suing everyone. Meanwhile, Lou Grade suddenly saw his songwriting um, what is it, concessions, uh, which uh, he'd paid uh, an awful lot of money for, virtually to get hold of John and I. He suddenly saw that I was now claiming that I had writing half of my stuff with Linda, and that if I was writing half of it, then she was entitled to uh, a pure half of it. So I get that because this is, you know, Paul saying, you know, in a way, getting to get more money for him, you know, was that's how he's Linda. doing it. Just throw, throw yeah, Linda on because it's my wife, right? Right. 
Yeah. Right. Um, let's see here. No matter what, recognize. Uh, I didn't think uh, that was important. I thought to whoever I worked with, uh, no matter the method of collaboration was that person. Uh, if they did they help, help me, me on, this, yeah. on the song, they, they should have a portion of, of the song for helping me. Uh, I think at the time, their big organist suddenly thought, hello, they're pulling a fast one. They're, they're trying to get some of the money back, whereas in fact, it was the truth. So there he is admitting it admitting it right i mean that's right. what it, i'm reading you know so they slapped a vast amount uh, uh on us i can't remember what i wrote uh, so he's still not saying that's why we did the tv show you know you know what i mean so you know he's saying he's talking about the the, the lawsuit but he's not saying well, how you well know, I'll, I'll pick it up from here and then he goes i wrote yeah. sir, lou, sir lou a long letter saying quote don't you think i ought to be able to do this and that and don't think, don't you think I've done enough? And don't you think I'm okay? And hey, man, why do you got to sue me? End quote. He wrote me back a very rational letter. I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was a very nice letter. He's actually okay, Lou. He's all right. And then Gambaccini <laughs> asks him, you did a TV show for him. And then right. Paul says, after it. Yeah, that's right. All the sheets were dropped, dropped by then. Bit me tongue. So we kind of masqueraded and danced around the whole James Paul McCartney right. thing, even though he talked about it. Right. So, but he's still not saying, yeah, that was the James Paul McCartney. That was show. the deal. That was the deal. <laughs> right. The deal was, I'm going to do this show, and then right. we're going to we're going to be okay. Right. right. Yeah. Then you get a little bit into George here. What was the when, when was the last time you saw George? Um, he goes, George. Uh, it's been a little while. Yeah. Um, then he's talking about the Bangladesh. Had, had George invited you to uh, the Bangladesh uh, benefit? And uh, he's saying, yeah, George inv invited me. And I must say it was uh, more than just visa problems at the time. There was the whole Apple thing when the Beatles broke up at first. I thought, right, broken up, no more messing up. with it. Uh, George came up and asked if I wanted to play Bangladesh. And I thought, blimey, what's the point? We're just broken up. And we're joining up again. It just seemed a bit crazy. So yeah, with the lawsuit going on, it's almost kind of like you feel like he's, it's the same thing with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, there's a lawsuit going on. Yeah. You thought it would have been like a cheap reunion, perhaps. Why am I? Yeah. Why you am know? I getting together? You know? Why am I? You right. Know, would have been nice if he had actually just said, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna go. But it was so right. It was so three to one in the early '70s there that you know, especially in '71, mm -hmm. August of '71, there was no way that was gonna happen then. It was two, right, it was right. way too three to one. Things got a little good there again, there in the mid in 73, four, five, when things kind of, mm -hmm. but then, and then John dies, and then they discover the whole McCartney clause thing in 83, which leads the rift, which was why he didn't appear at the Hall of Fame right. induction in 87. So it's had an ebb and flow of like they were apart, then things were a little rosy again, then they were apart again. It's, it's kind of, it's done a lot of this. Right. Throughout throughout the 70s and the 80s there. Yeah. So those were the bits that we highlighted. Um, you know, the, the, the interview continues a little bit longer, but, uh, you know, you guys can read that uh, for yeah. yourselves. But, uh, but all in all, again, you know, pretty interesting interview. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. And first, first, again, first one in Rolling Stone, the first of, you know, many, many Rolling Stone interviews over the years, uh, you know, that with McCartney that have done. But that was the first yeah. one. You know, it was, it was, I know they, they were they did features on him again in '76 and '79 and '79, '80. Right. I mean, yeah. Then there was the uh, the I think 80. it was what '80, '82 or '83 with the say you know Paul and the illustra illustrated cover with with Paul and and, and Michael Jackson. That um, uh, I yeah. know. He's 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 on the cover again right. in '89 with the Flowers tour. Right. He, he he had a, he was on there as well. So. I'm sure we'll, we'll revisit, you know, some more of these Rolling Stone interviews, but we like pulling the best bits when we can find Paul speaking a little bit frank and a little bit about his solo career. You know, we know, right. we know the Beatles stories inside and out, but anytime we can talk about uh, anything a little bit uh, that's outside of his comfort zone, we like kind of going in and pulling out the best bits like we just did here, you see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm surprised he's had this long lasting relationship with Rolling Stone because they did kind of dupe him. Um, you know, he, he, uh, they had, they asked him if he, if he, he had induct uh, John Lennon into the, into the hall of fame, they would, uh, induct him the following year. Well, well, they didn't. And they, what, it was another what, four or five years later before he ended up getting, uh, inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame. And, well, John was um, inducted in 94 yeah. as a solo artist and Paul right. got it in 99. 
Right. So still, I mean, you know, he was promised that he would get in next year if if he would induct, you know, Lennon into the into the but Hall of Fame. At least that's how the story goes. And yeah. he had to wait a few more a few more years. So yeah. So I mean, if, um, if it was me, the Beatles and all the solo Beatles should have been in in '87. <laughs> like they should. Yeah. They just should have all been in individually and all that. Then. <laughs> I agree. Done. I agree. Um, so, yeah, but uh, there's before we sign off, I do want there's one thing I do wanted to talk to you about, because, you know, I had to, told you recently that I had gotten the uh, the complete works here. Complete works. Congratulations. The, uh, the Japanese well done there, young version. Padawan. Yes, thank you. Um, and you had mentioned that, you know, I, you know, been, you know, been spending, you know, some good, good money on an album that, you know, I really don't find as one of his best you know what i mean so you know i wanted to present that question to you and and you know as you as a collector you know as a collector mccartney collector and and other mccartney collectors out there um you know if you're listening or watching please comment on this question is is even if there's an album in paul's discography that you're not the biggest fan of i mean would you still collect you know items you know that that are you know involving that that particular album you know, I so. I think definitely yes. I mean, uh, as far as the main as the main canon goes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, press to play. It's hard to think of the albums that are not huge. Well, know, you you huge. recently got um, the uh, Broad Street press kit, right? Yes, I did. And that's not like particularly one of your favorite, you know, McCartney records, though. Is no, it? no, but I would go grab mm -hmm. anything that I could associated mm -hmm. with that. Now, am I going to go grab right. every format or anything associated with like Ocean's Kingdom? No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just that's not the kind of I, I the core canon. You, you know, you would like to get everything on vinyl if you can. The classical stuff, the box. I'm not going to seek out the classical stuff on vinyl. I just the, the main the main canon mm -hmm. to me is worth it to have it. The main canon singles, 45s, 12 inches. You know, your CDs, you name it. Uh, the occasional right. odd experimental thing on CD, if you can find it halfway decent priced, yeah, I might get a fire of the sh strawberries, ocean ships, forest CD if I if I saw it. But uh, I'm not going to go spending two hundred dollars on it on vinyl on e on eBay. I'm just not going to do it. Because why? <laughs> I'm never going to play it. Right. I'm just. Mm. That's just. You know, if I'm going to play it once or twice, have an enjoyment of it, and file it away, that's one thing. But uh, yeah, yeah, everybody has their everybody has their their niche and what they will collect. You don't like that album, but you got a really cool collectible for, uh, yeah, that's the hard to come yeah. by. I mean, it is, it is hard to come by. I mean, especially the European one, uh, European one's even harder to come by. This is the Japanese. Yeah, you uh, got, I have the European yeah. one. You have the Japanese yeah. one because my European yeah. one is just in a, is in a, is in a, yeah. Yeah. is in a this single is the double. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Right. It's in that, but yeah, you got a, that one. So that's the, that's the, the just, that's the Japanese one, Tom. Yes, that's the yeah. Japanese. So I have another Japanese off the ground, but it's a little different. But you got the little three-inch uh, CD in that one, right? This one has the little disc, yeah. the, the little yes. disc. Bit. So yeah there's, yeah, there's a lot. There's lots of these ones floating around for an album. Yes, so you can, Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. I mean, I see those from time to time at the Zia stores. You know, I, I really don't bother it? that. No, I mean because I mean I've got this now. I mean, what I don't really True. you know. You know, don't really need that, and plus, I don't know if I, if my CD player has the little, uh, the little dish in it, so you could put a three inch. Um, you got to have the kind of player you know, that you got to have you can, exactly. It can sit yeah. in. You've got to have one of those old right. five disc spinner ones where you can just drop them yes. in. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because that was not the first time he's done. I mean, because he did do the 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 three inch disc for oh, uh, oh, figure, oh, of eight. Oh, Fig figure of eight. Figure of eight. Party and then there was party. also the three inch in the in, in the world tour pack for That's party the party, for, party, the CD, party. For, the C, for the CD for the CD yeah. version. Yeah. Not and I'm glad LP. to say I finally got the vinyl version coming. Uh so I got the seven inch of party party coming. So I'm very excited about that. Well done. <laughs> uh, there you yes, go. Yes, yes. So uh the never ending uh, uh McCartney collecting uh hole is is, is still being dug uh, as we speak and um I think uh, that's it for this week, buddy. That's going to be it, everybody. So um, we are going to wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, leave us, uh, you know, some comments on what you think about uh, the interviews and Paul's interviews over the years. If you would like to reach us, you can kind of find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Two Legs Podcast. You can email us at twolegspodcast.com. All of our podcasts are everywhere where you can find them on audio and uh, video streaming platforms. So. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, for my partner, Tom, I am Andy, and we will see you next time.